Some time ago, a group of young children were asked to list someone they saw as a hero. The names given were all TV or movie celebrities, sports figures, singers, or the president. And this exercise is likely a good reflection of where we are now as a nation. Previous generations called these kinds of people celebrities while reserving the designation of hero for someone characterized by unique courage, nobility, achievement, or sacrifice. As George Guthrie puts it, our age of high tech has transformed the movie actor, the singer, and the football star into larger-than-life figures, blurring the lines between superstar status and true heroism. What has been made clear in recent weeks is that political leaders now garner votes through image, marketing savvy, and ingenuity rather than through moral excellence. Henry Kissinger once did a book review of the 1995 book Churchill by Norman Rose. In that review, he gave insightful observation on the difference between a true hero and a mere celebrity. He said, our age finds it difficult to come to grips with figures like Winston Churchill. The political leaders with whom we are familiar generally aspire to be superstars rather than heroes. The distinction, he said, is crucial. Superstars strive for approbation. Heroes walk alone. Superstars crave consensus. Heroes define themselves by the judgment of a future they see it as their task to bring about. Superstars seek success in a technique for eliciting support. Heroes pursue success in the outgrowth of inner value. Then he added, the modern political leader today rarely ventures to comment in public without having tested his views with a focus group, if indeed he does not derive them from a focus group. But to a man like Churchill, the very concept of a focus group would have been unimaginable. Thus, in the space of a generation, Churchill, the quintessential hero, has been transformed from the mythic to the nearly incomprehensible. Qualities like walking alone on the basis of inner values characterize true heroes. Most true heroes go unsung giving their lives in quiet, quiet service in a number of different roles. But we now live in a world where true heroism is confused with fame. Even the church has bought into this fuzzy notion and has exalted certain celebrities that profess to be Christians into the status of being superstars. Every time a sports figure or a rock singer supposedly becomes a Christian, we see it as a special coup for the faith. Many in the church begin to think that their acceptance of Christianity somehow gives special credence to the kingdom of God or that their fame will somehow aid in the advancement of the gospel. Sometimes their speaking role in the church takes precedence over the faithful preaching and teaching of the Word of God. They are seen as more important than godly shepherds who have given their entire lives in the service of the Lord. The truth of the matter is, 
We don't need celebrities. We need true heroes of the faith. We need genuine examples of true devotion to Christ. And I believe that is the reason why we see so many examples on the pages of the Bible. Most of us grew up learning about the great heroes of God in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And folks, that is very important. In the ancient world, the use of examples was a common rhetorical methodology. Examples were used in both positive and negative ways. And in Hebrews 3, 1 through 6, we see the first mention in this book of a great Old Testament hero. We see a reference to Moses who was seen by most Jews of that day as the greatest man in the history of God's people. And even though this passage is about the superiority of Christ over Moses, we do see where Moses was faithful in his God-assigned role. Men like this are important as examples of true heroism in the faith. And in order to grasp the significance of this passage, we really need to understand how the Jews of that day revered this man Moses. John MacArthur says, Moses was esteemed by the Jews far above any other Jew who ever lived. And of course, we know that God supernaturally protected him in his infancy. We know that God ultimately buried him at the end of his life. We know that he was personally called by God into this unique role through a burning bush experience. He was a man who stood up to the most powerful man on earth, the Egyptian Pharaoh. We know of all the mighty miracles that God performed through this man, the incredible plagues of Egypt, as well as the crossing of the Red Sea. We also know that he was a man who actually saw God on the mountain, and he was a, a man that God spoke to face to face. He was the great deliverer who led Israel out of bondage in Egypt and shepherded them in the wilderness. He not only gave the Ten Commandments, but the entire law. He was the man who wrote the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. He was the one through whom God provided the plans for the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant. He was a man who stood in the gap and interceded for his people on a number of different occasions and turned away the wrath of God. He was indeed a great man. And yet Numbers 12.3 tells us he was more humble than any other man on earth. Moses is mentioned 70 times in the New Testament. And by the way, it is very important for us to hold up true heroes of the faith to our children in days like these. We need to talk about great men and women from ancient times to modern times who have demonstrated true faith in God and have stood on that faith against incredible opposition. We need to know about men like Polycarp, William Tyndale, John Huss, Martin Luther, Hudson Taylor, Jim Elliott, and many more. And we need to hold up to our children great heroes of the faith in Scripture, like Daniel, David, and the Apostle Paul. We need to hold up great women of the faith as well. 
And as Christian parents, we really should ask ourselves the question of whether or not our children are more enamored with sports figures, cartoon figures, or celebrity icons than they are with the great heroes of the faith in the Word of God and in church history. Of course, Jesus Christ is the ultimate example we need to focus on. In fact, that is the message of this passage. Consider Jesus. Although there are many examples of godly faith in Scripture, our ultimate example is the Lord Jesus Christ. As George Guthrie puts it, great religious heroes like Moses serve as spiritual telescopes, tools used by God to magnify someone greater than themselves. For it is to Jesus, the one who stands at the heart of the faith, that we must look if we are to endure in our Christian commitment. So with all that in mind this morning, we need to move now into our text. All that was introduction, okay? But let's see what the Spirit of God wants to teach us here in this passage of Scripture. Now, one of the most powerful aspects of this particular book of the Bible is that it is in the form of a sermon. And the author moves back and forth between exposition and application. Sprinkled throughout this book, we find sections of exhortation, warnings and commands related to the truth that is being conveyed. And what we need to understand here is that the passage we're looking at this morning is the first part of a large section of exhortation. And that section runs all the way from chapter 3, verse 1, to chapter 4 and verse 16. In this first part, we see a comparison and a contrast between Jesus and Moses. The author of Hebrews follows his typical pattern of giving an exhortation and then providing the basis or the grounds for that exhortation. And that's what we'll see here in this passage. We're going to take these first six verses in four divisions this morning. And the first thing we see is the command. Look with me at verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and the high priest of our confession. First of all, this section is clearly addressed to believers. The phrase, holy brethren, cannot be taken any other way. These are fellow Christians, those who are true brothers in Christ. And that word brethren or brothers is pointing back likely to the truth of chapter 2 verse 11, which says, for both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one father Uh, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He also makes mention of the fact that they are his brethren at the end of chapter 2 in verse 17. And notice they are referred to as partakers of the heavenly calling. That phrase likely refers to the effectual calling of God unto salvation. Uh, Jimmy Draper uh, describes this as a calling from heaven to heaven. This calling is one that God has initiated. Jesus said in John 6, 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Salvation is a heavenly calling. It is a calling from heaven to heaven. It is something that God himself does. It is a calling that is initiated by God himself. But this heavenly calling not only points to our ultimate destiny, 
It also refers to our present perspective. Later, the author of Hebrews is going to describe these believers as those who desire a heavenly country and a heavenly Jerusalem. And John MacArthur says, all these blessings show the superiority of Christianity to Judaism. Judaism was an earthly calling with an earthly inheritance. Christianity is a spiritual and heavenly calling with a spiritual and heavenly inheritance. As Paul wrote in Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is now in heaven. That is now our true home. We are strangers and pilgrims in this world. We're just passing through. Our real home is in heaven, and we are to live in this present world in light of that ultimate destination. Paul put it this way in Colossians 3, 1 through 4, if then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on the things that are on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. This calling, this heavenly calling is to let go of earthly things, to set our hearts on our ultimate home. <coughs> we are ultimately citizens of heaven. That is where our hearts are to be. We're to hold the things of this world loosely, knowing that it is all just temporary. And that is the heavenly perspective that we're to have. But there's no question at all here that the author of Hebrews is speaking to believers in chapter 3, verse 1. However, we can understand from the larger exhortation that he's going to give here that these are believers who are beginning to waver a little bit in their commitment to Christ. As Jewish Christians, they are glancing back at Judaism. And that's why they're being admonished here to consider Jesus. Because once they are fully convinced of the vast superiority of Jesus, then they will no longer be tempted to turn back to Judaism. And in essence, what they're being asked here is, why would you want to hang on to the earthly rituals, the earthly symbols and ceremonies when you now have the real thing. You now have the heavenly reality. Now, there's some application for us here as well because religion has always tended to cling to rituals and ceremonies, but we have the spiritual reality in Christ. One author says there is a place there is no place in biblical Christianity for externalism because Christians have continual access to spiritual reality. Those things that were related to the ceremonies in the Old Testament, those were just the shadows. Those were the symbols pointing to the reality. We now have the reality in Christ. For Christians... To hang on to earthly religious trappings not only is unnecessary and pointless, but really it can be spiritually harmful because to do so can keep us from experiencing the fullness of our new relationship with Christ and from being able to follow him faithfully as we ought. And remember now, this book is really a sermon and it is addressed to a mixed audience. Portions of it are aimed at unbelievers. Some of it is directed toward those who have become 
intellectually convinced of the truth of the gospel, but have fallen short of fully committing to it. And then there are sections like this one that are directed at believers. In this case, believers that are beginning to waver a bit. It was a major challenge for the Jews in the first century to abandon Judaism for Christianity. And you had all kinds of things going on, going on in this first century. You had the Judaizers who were trying to put Jewish believers back under the bondage of legalism. You had religious persecution from Jewish unbelievers who were saying that uh, these Jewish Christians were rejecting the heritage of their forefathers, and so they were persecuting them. So this entire section here is focused on those who were Jewish Christians who had one eye on Christ, but had the other eye glancing back at Judaism. And the message is, since Jesus is greater than any aspect of Judaism, they need to keep their eye fully on him and not keep looking back to that which was just pointing to him. Now the word therefore in verse 1 refers back to what had been said previously. This is the author's way of saying, in light of all I have said, consider Jesus first and foremost. That may apply specifically to what he said in the previous chapter, that Christ is a faithful high priest who is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. The word consider there means more than to merely look at something. It means fix your mind on it. This is a word that implies continual action. And the idea is put your mind on Jesus and keep it there. Keep your focus on Christ alone. He is our ultimate example. We're to fix our eyes on the one who is the pre supreme example of faithfulness. And on the basis of who he is and what he has done, we are to consider him and to come to the conclusion he is all we need. Now the concept here is the very same that we will later see expressed in chapter 12 and verse 2 where it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Here the command is to fix our eyes on Jesus who is the apostle and high priest of our confession. But our focus must remain on Christ alone. And the fact that he calls these believers holy points to the fact that they have experienced the purification of sins through faith in Jesus Christ. Chapter 2, verse 17 tells us that Christ made propitiation for sins. So these believers now are completely pure before God positionally. And of course, all the way back in chapter 1 and verse 3, we saw where Jesus came for the express purpose of making purification for sins. And in chapter 2, verse 11, we see where he is the one who makes men holy. He is the only one who can do that. He is the one who sanctifies sinners. But he's clearly speaking here to those who are now sanctified, those who have now been cleansed from their sins. They have been made holy positionally in Christ. And because of this, he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Notice the word partakers there. This is an interesting word, important word, uh, a key word in this book. It's a word that's often misunderstood. Herschel Hobbes says, unfortunately, the English word has come to mean largely to share in something received, such as partaking in a meal. And we know when we say that phrase, 
partaking in a meal. We know we get to eat part of it, right? But this word means much more than that. It is the Greek word metakos. It does, in fact, mean sharers, but it really means to share fully. The word partners is probably a better translation. It is the same word for companions in chapter 1, verse 9. These are the heavenly companions who have become full sharers in the heavenly calling of Christ. This word partakers is used several places in the New Testament. For example, it's used in 2 Peter 1, 4, where it says that believers in Christ have become partakers of the divine nature. It's used in Colossians 1.12 where it says believers have become qualified to share in the inheritance of the saints. Now we're also told that we are sharers in the sufferings of Christ and that's 1 Peter 4.13. But in all of those passages, it's the very same word. And the idea seems to be that we have become one with Christ. Therefore, we now share as partners with him in every way. And notice that Jesus is referred to here as the apostle and high priest of our confession. This is the only place in the New Testament where Jesus is referred to as an apostle. But that is likely used in a general sense as a sent one, one who is sent on behalf of another. This is pointing to the fact that Jesus was sent by God the Father. But notice it does not say an apostle, it says the apostle. He is the only one sent by God in this unique way as the Son. In fact, the author of Hebrews does not call anyone else an apostle in this book. He reserves this title for Jesus Christ alone. Of course, we know that Jesus had 12 apostles, but this is employing this concept in a totally different way. This goes back to what he said in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, that Jesus is the full and final revelation of God to man. He is the only one who can be called the apostle in this sense. He is the only one who can reveal God to men. So here in this context, you could say that Jesus is the supreme apostle. He is the only one who could come from God and reveal to us God's nature and plan and purpose. He is also our perfect high priest. And we're going to see several chapters on what this means. But for now, suffice it to say, he is the supreme mediator between God and men. He is the one who came to fully atone for our sin. He is a merciful high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. Now, the Latin word for high priest is the word pontifex. It literally means bridge builder. Jesus Christ is the ultimate bridge builder. He has built a bridge between God and men. Now, the Roman Catholic Church has wrongly applied this title to the Pope, but Jesus Christ is the only one deserving of this title. He is the only one who could build a bridge between God and men. He is the one and only sent one from God who came with all God's power and spoke God's voice. But he is also the only one who can bring God and men together. He has not only made it possible for us to know God, but to ultimately one day live forever in the presence of God. As the Bible says, no one, can go to the Father except through Christ. That's John 14, 6. And then notice the last part of verse 1. 
consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. The author of Hebrews is a confession of their faith in Jesus Christ. The word confession or profession, if you will, is one's avowal to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, we're going to see this word again when we get to chapter 4, verse 14, and in chapter 10, verse 23. And you probably have already guessed that we're not going to make it all the way through this passage this morning because there's so much good stuff here, right? But before we move off of verse 1, note how this compares with Moses. He's going to be moving into a comparison and contrast of Jesus to Moses. But notice that even though Moses was seen as an Old Testament apostle in the sense that he was sent by God and represented God to the people, he was not a priest, much less a high priest. His brother Aaron was the high priest. And the fact that Jesus was both the apostle and high priest indicates his superiority over Moses. And as we will see, his superiority is seen in the fact that he has brought a better covenant. In fact, he himself is the sacrifice that would make that new covenant effective. Many years ago in a seminary chapel service, someone introduced Dr. Everett Gill as a foreign missionary. Dr. Gill said, no, I'm not a foreign missionary. The world has had but one foreign missionary, Jesus, who was sent by the Father to the earth. He said, I'm just a missionary serving in Europe as you young preachers serve in areas near this campus. So what is this communicating? It is communicating that Christ is the ultimate apostle, the only true high priest. And in this way, he is vastly superior to Moses. Well, let's see if we can at least get one more point in our outline. You think we can do that? Notice, secondly, the comparison, the comparison. Go with me to verse 2. He, that is Christ, was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was in all his house. At this point, the author of Hebrews is not making a contrast, but a comparison. Both were faithful. Before showing Jesus' superiority over Moses, he talks about the resemblance between the two. Like Jesus, Moses was faithful. He was faithful in all his, that is God's, house. Now this comes from Numbers 12, verses 7 and 8, where it says, My servant Moses is faithful in all my household, with him I speak face to face. The word, God, word of God tells us that Moses was faithful in all God called him to do. And that is confirmed by the fact that God spoke to him face to face. There is no one else in the Old Testament that can be said of. God spoke to his prophets through dreams and visions, but with Moses he spoke face to face, like a close friend. And we need to remember how the Jews of that day regarded Moses. It is difficult for us Gentiles in this day and time to fully comprehend this. But nearly everything that was connected with God for the Jews was also connected with Moses. So the Spirit of God, through the human author of Hebrews, is beginning with this positive affirmation of Moses' faithfulness. He was faithful to do all God called him to do. 
He was faithful in standing up to Pharaoh and in leading the Israelites out of Egypt. He was faithful in the wilderness. He was faithful in the giving of the law and in his intercession on behalf of the people. Moses was a faithful servant. He was faithful to the one who sent him. And in the same way, Jesus was faithful to to the one who appointed him as well. As God's supreme apostle, God's supreme sent one, he was completely faithful to the will of the Father. Now the Gospels testify Jesus always did the Father's will. In fact, he said in John 7, 18, he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true and there's no unrighteousness in him. In other words, you can tell I'm the true apostle because I don't seek my own glory, but the glory of the one who sent me. In John 5, 30, he said, I can do nothing on my own initiative As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Moses was faithful to the one who sent him, and so was Jesus Christ. Now that phrase, in all his house, in verse 2, means that Israel was established by God And Moses was a steward over that house. It was God's house, but Moses was faithful to manage it according to God's design. And by the way, that's the definition of a steward. And the Bible says all of us as believers are stewards. And that faithfulness is the primary characteristic of a steward. In fact, we read in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy or faithful. Moses was faithful over God's house. He was willing to go and do all the Lord commanded him to do. He was willing to go against some of the greatest opposition in the history of the world. He was willing to do that which was hard. He was ready to walk by faith when he couldn't see how Pharaoh would ever let the people go or how they would ever get across the Red Sea. He was a faithful man, but Jesus was even more so. And although Moses was faithful, he was not perfect. Jesus, on the other hand, perfectly obeyed the will of the Father. And because of that, Christ is our ultimate example. Now, next time, we're going to see the contrast. We're going to see that Christ is superior to Moses. Therefore, the covenant that he brought is superior to the one that Moses brought. Where do you stand today with the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know him as your Lord and Savior? Have you made that confession of your faith to him? Have you publicly identified with Christ in believer's baptism? Have you put your faith and trust in him alone for salvation? If not, I encourage you to do that this morning. And perhaps there are those here today that have never Receive Christ as Lord and Savior. And I urge you to do that this morning. Don't leave this place without making sure that you have put your faith and trust in Christ. He alone is the apostle, the high priest of our confession. Maybe there are those this morning that have done that, but you need a church home. You need a place where you can grow in the Lord, a place where you can serve the Lord, a place where you can be a part of reaching a community for Christ. And perhaps this is where the Lord wants you to be. And you need to respond in that way this morning. Maybe there are others that you're wrestling with various things and 
and uh, you've got some things that are heavy on your heart today and, and you need someone to help you, talk with you and counsel with you. In a moment, we're gonna observe our Lord's Supper uh, service together. And then after that, at the end of the service, we'll have some of our elders here at the front. And I urge you to come and talk with them. And uh, whether it's the need to receive Christ, whether it's the need to be baptized, be, become a member of the church family, or anything else uh, that you need to deal with this morning, I want to encourage you to do that. Let's pray together, and we'll observe the Lord's Supper together. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. Lord, we thank you for the forcefulness of it. We thank you for uh, the commands that are given. And uh, Lord, we, we thank you today that uh, we don't have to guess about it because your word is clear. And uh, you have clearly laid out the gospel. You've clearly laid out uh, the only person uh, through whom we can have salvation and eternal life, and that's the Lord Jesus. So, Lord, we pray this morning that uh, those who might be here this morning have never trusted in you and never made that confession of faith, that they would do that this morning. And, Lord, I pray for all of us, whatever our situation may be this morning, that we would respond to your word as you would want us to, that we won't just hear and walk away, but that we would be doers of the word. We would be responders to your word this morning. And Lord, help us to do that. Lord, as we observe the Lord's Supper, uh, now help us uh, to understand the significance of that. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would use all of this in our own lives as we uh, offer it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me ask our men who will be serving the Lord's Supper.